Beyond Freedom and Dignity by B. F. Skinner. In trying to solve the terrifying problems that face us in the world today, we play from strength, and our strength is science and technology. We can point to remarkable achievements in these fields, and it is not surprising that we should try to extend them. But things grow steadily worse, and it is disheartening to find that technology itself is increasingly at fault. Sanitation and medicine have made the problems of population more acute. War has acquired a new horror with the invention of nuclear weapons, and the affluent pursuit of happiness is largely responsible for pollution. Whether or not he could have foreseen the damage, man must repair it or all is lost. The application of the physical and biological sciences alone will not solve our problems because the solutions lie in another field. In short, we need to make vast changes in human behavior. It is not enough to use technology with a deeper understanding of human issues, or to dedicate technology to man's spiritual needs, or to encourage technologists to look at human problems. What we need is a technology of behavior. We could solve our problems quickly enough if we could adjust the growth of the world's population as precisely as we adjust the course of a spaceship, or move toward a peaceful world with something like the steady progress with which physics has approached absolute zero. As to technology, we have made immense strides in controlling the physical and biological worlds. But our practices in government, education, and much of economics have not greatly improved. It can always be argued that human behavior is a particularly difficult field. It is. And we are especially likely to think so just because we are so inept in dealing with it. Was putting a man on the moon actually easier than improving education in our public schools? Or than constructing better kinds of living space for everyone? Or than making it possible for everyone to be gainfully employed? The exciting thing about getting to the moon was its feasibility. Science and technology had reached the point at which with one great push the thing could be done. There is no comparable excitement about the problems posed by human behavior. We are not close to solutions. Human behavior is still commonly attributed to indwelling agents. A juvenile delinquent is said, for example, to be suffering from a disturbed personality. Psychoanalysts have identified three of these personalities, the ego, the superego, and id and interactions among them are said to be responsible for the behavior of the man in whom they dwell. Behavior is still attributed to human nature, and there is an extensive psychology of individual differences in which people are compared and described in terms of traits of character, capacities, and abilities. We are told that to control the number of people in the world, we need to change attitudes toward children, overcome pride in size of family or in sexual potency, build some sense of responsibility toward offspring. To work for peace, we must deal with the will to power, the paranoid delusions of leaders, and that man is aggressive by nature. To solve the problems of the poor, we must inspire self-respect, encourage initiative, and reduce frustration. To allay the disaffection of the young, we must provide a sense of purpose and reduce feelings of alienation and hopelessness. This is staple fare. Almost no one questions it, and that fact may well explain why a science and a technology of behavior have been so long delayed. The dimensions of the world of the mind and the transition from one world to another do raise embarrassing problems, but it is usually possible to ignore them. And this may be good strategy, for the important objection to mentalism is of a very different sort. The world of the mind steals the show. Behavior is not recognized as a subject in its own right. The disturbing things a person does or says are almost always regarded merely as symptoms. Compared with the fascinating dramas which are staged in the depths of the mind, behavior itself seems superficial indeed. In political science, theology, and economics,
Behavior is usually regarded as the material from which one infers attitudes, intentions, needs, and so on. For more than 2,500 years, close attention has been paid to mental life, but only recently has any effort been made to study human behavior as something more than a mere byproduct. A long time ago, William James corrected a prevailing view of the relation between feelings and action by asserting, for example, that we do not run away because we are afraid, but we are afraid because we run away. In other words, what we feel when we feel afraid is our behavior. The psychotherapist learns about the early life of his patient almost exclusively from the patient's memories, which are known to be unreliable. And he may even argue that what is important is not what actually happened, but what the patient remembers. We attribute a person's behavior to a person we cannot see, whose behavior we cannot explain either, but about whom we are not inclined to ask questions. The task of a scientific analysis is to explain how the behavior of a person as a physical system is related to the conditions under which the human species evolved and the conditions under which the individual lives. Unless there is indeed some capricious or creative intervention, these events must be related. Our age is not suffering from anxiety, but from the accidents, crimes, wars, and other dangerous and painful things to which people are so often exposed. Young people drop out of school, refuse to get jobs, and associate only with others of their own age, not because they feel alienated, but because of defective social environments in homes, schools, factories, and elsewhere. Descartes first suggested that the environment might play an active role in the determination of behavior, and he was apparently able to do so only because he was given a strong hint. He knew about certain automata, or mechanical figures, in the royal gardens of France, which were operated hydraulically by concealed valves. As Descartes described it, people entering the gardens necessarily tread on certain tiles or plates which are so disposed that if they approach a bathing Diana, they cause her to hide in the rose bushes, and if they try to follow her, they cause a Neptune to come forward to meet them, threatening them with his trident. The figures were entertaining just because they behaved like people, and it appeared that something very much like human behavior could be explained mechanically. Descartes took the hint. Living organisms might move for similar reasons. The triggering action of the environment came to be called a stimulus. The effect on an organism, a response. And together they were said to compose a reflex. Descartes' hypothesis held a dominant position in behavior theory for a long time. But it was a false scent from which scientific analysis is only now recovering. The environment not only prods or lashes, it selects. It is now clear that we must take into account what the environment does to an organism not only before, but after it responds. Behavior is shaped and maintained by its consequences. Once this fact is recognized, we can formulate the interaction between organism and environment in a much more comprehensive way. There are two important results. Behavior which operates upon the environment to produce consequences, operant behavior, can be studied by arranging environments in which specific consequences are contingent upon it. The second result is practical. The environment can be manipulated. Man's genetic endowment can be changed only very slowly, but changes in the environment of the individual have quick and dramatic effects. That possibility raises another problem. We have moved forward by dispossessing autonomous man, but he has not departed gracefully. He can marshal formidable support. He is still an important figure in political science, law, religion, economics, and family life. Two features of autonomous man are particularly troublesome. In the traditional view, a person is free. He is autonomous. He can therefore be held responsible for what he does and justly punished if he offends. Despite this, 
Theologians have accepted that man must be predestined to do what an omniscient God knows he will do. Soothsayers and astrologers often claim to predict what men will do. Montaigne and Bacon imply some kind of predictability in human conduct. Autonomous man survives in the face of all this because he is the happy exception. Theologians have reconciled predestination with free will, and the Greek audience, moved by the portrayal of an inescapable destiny, walked out of the theater free men. On the other hand, Freudians have no hesitation in assuring their patients that they are the architects of their own destinies. This escape route is slowly closed as new evidences of the predictability of human behavior are discovered. Joseph Wood Crutch acknowledged, we can predict with a considerable degree of accuracy how many people will go to the seashore on a given day, even how many will jump off a bridge. By questioning the autonomous man and demonstrating the control exercised by the environment, a science of behavior also seems to question dignity or worth. A person is responsible for his behavior, not only in the sense that he may be justly blamed or punished when he behaves badly, but also in the sense that he is to be given credit and admired for his achievements. A scientific analysis shifts the credit as well as the blame to the environment. As the emphasis shifts to the environment, the individual seems to be exposed to a new kind of danger. Who is to construct the controlling environment and to what end? Freedom, dignity and value are major issues and unfortunately they become more crucial as the power of a technology of behavior becomes more nearly commensurate with the problems to be solved. Until these issues are resolved, a technology of behavior will continue to be rejected, and with it possibly the only way to solve our problems. Freedom. Almost all living things act to free themselves from harmful contacts. A kind of freedom is achieved by the relatively simple forms of behavior called reflexes. A person sneezes and freezes respiratory passages. He pulls back his hand and frees it from a sharp or hot object. When confined, people struggle in rage and break free. A much more important role is played by a behavior which weakens harmful stimuli in another way. It is not acquired in the form of conditioned reflexes, but as the product of a different process called operant conditioning. When a bit of behavior is followed by a certain kind of consequence, it is more likely to occur again. A consequence having this effect is called a reinforcer. Food, for example, is a reinforcer to a hungry organism. Some stimuli are called negative reinforcers. Any response which reduces the intensity of such a stimulus or ends it is more likely to be emitted when the stimulus recurs. Thus, if a person escapes from a hot sun when he moves under cover, he is more likely to move under cover when the sun is again hot. Operant conditioning also occurs when a person simply avoids a hot sun, when, roughly speaking, he escapes from the threat of a hot sun. Negative reinforcers are called aversive in the sense that they are the things organisms turn away from. Escape and avoidance play a much more important role in the struggle for freedom when the aversive conditions are generated by other people. Thus, a slave driver induces a slave to work by whipping him when he stops. By resuming work, the slave escapes from the whipping and incidentally reinforces the slave driver's behavior in using the whip. A person may escape from slavery, emigrate or defect from a government, desert from an army, become an apostate from a religion, play truant, leave home, or drop out of a culture as a hobo, hermit, or hippie. Such behavior is as much. A person escapes from or destroys the power of a controller in order to feel free. And once he feels free and can do what he desires, no further action is recommended 
and none is prescribed by the literature of freedom except perhaps eternal vigilance, lest control be resumed. The feeling of freedom becomes an unreliable guide to action as soon as would-be controllers turn to non-aversive measures. Although it has long been recognized that rewards have useful effects, wage systems have evolved slowly. In the 19th century, it was believed that an industrial society required a hungry labor force. Wages would be effective only if the hungry worker could exchange them for food. By making labor less aversive, for instance, by shortening hours and improving conditions, it has been possible to get men to work for lesser rewards. The skillful parent learns to reward a child for good behavior. Religious agencies move from the threat of hellfire to an emphasis on God's love. The literature of freedom has never come to grips with techniques of control which do not generate escape or counterattack because it has dealt with the problem in terms of states of mind and feelings. What a person feels when he feels himself wanting something depends upon circumstances. Wanting is not, however, a feeling, nor is a feeling the reason a person acts to get what he wants. But freedom is a matter of contingencies of reinforcement, not of the feelings the contingencies generate. The distinction is particularly important when the contingencies do not generate escape or counterattack. The uncertainty which surrounds the counter-control of non-aversive measures is easily exemplified. The issue arises when a government runs a lottery in order to raise revenue to reduce taxes. The government takes the same amount of money from its citizens in both cases, although not necessarily from the same citizens. By running a lottery, it avoids certain unwanted consequences. People escape from heavy taxation by moving away, or they counterattack by throwing out of office a government which imposes new taxes. A lottery has neither of these effects. The only opposition comes from those who oppose gambling enterprises and who seldom gamble. In the literature of freedom, it is said that it is better that a man feel free or believe that he is free. The literature of freedom has been designed to make men conscious of aversive control, but it has failed to rescue the happy slave. Jacques Rousseau, in his remarkable book, Emile, gave the following advice to teachers. Let the child believe that he is always in control, although it is always you, the teacher, who really controls. There is no subjugation so perfect as that which keeps the appearance of freedom, for in that way one captures volition itself. The problem is to free men not from control, but from certain kinds of control. We accept the fact that we depend upon the world around us, and we simply change the nature of the dependency. The literature of freedom has made the mistake of defining freedom in terms of states of mind or feelings, and it has therefore not been able to deal effectively with techniques of control which do not breed escape or revolt, but nevertheless have aversive consequences. It has been forced to brand all control as wrong. Dignity. Any evidence that a person's behavior may be attributed to external circumstances seems to threaten his dignity or worth. But as an analysis of behavior adds further evidence, the achievements for which a person himself is to be given credit seem to approach zero. And both the evidence and the science which produces it are then challenged. It has been customary to commend those who lead celibate lives, give away their fortunes, or remain loyal to a cause when persecuted, because there are clear reasons for behaving differently. The extent of the credit varies with the magnitude of the opposing conditions. We commend loyalty in proportion to the intensity of the persecution, generosity in proportion to the sacrifices entailed, and celibacy in proportion to a person's inclination to engage in sexual behavior. As La Rochefoucauld observed, no man deserves to be praised for his goodness unless he has strength of character to be wicked. 
We commend a prompt child more than the one who must be reminded of his appointments. We give more credit to a person for mental arithmetic than for arithmetic done on paper. We conceal control to avoid losing credit or to claim credit not really due us. The general does his best to maintain his dignity while riding in a jeep over rough terrain, and the flute player continues to play, although a fly crawls over his face. The television speaker uses a prompter which is out of sight, and the lecturer glances only surreptitiously at his notes. We try to avoid discredit for objectionable behavior by claiming irresistible reasons. As Chaudelot de Laclos observed in his Les Liaisons Dangereuses, a woman must have a pretext for giving herself to a man. What better than to appear to be yielding to force? We magnify the credit due us by exposing ourselves to conditions which ordinarily generate unworthy behavior. The saint in the desert maximized the virtues of an austere life by arranging to have beautiful women or delicious food nearby. We stand in awe of the inexplicable, and it is therefore not surprising that we are likely to admire behavior more as we understand it less. We seem to appeal to the miraculous when we admire behavior because we cannot strengthen it in any other way. We may coerce soldiers into risking their lives or pay them generously for doing so, and we may not admire them in either case. But to induce a man to risk his life when he does not have to, and when there are no obvious rewards, nothing seems available but admiration. A large part of the literature of dignity is concerned with justice, with the appropriateness of rewards and punishment. The child's first protest, that's not fair, is usually a matter of the magnitude of a reward or punishment. A person protests and incidentally feels indignant when he is unnecessarily jostled, tripped or pushed around, forced to work with the wrong tools, tricked into behaving foolishly with joke shop novelties, or forced to behave in demeaning ways, as in a jail or concentration camp. The artist objects to and resents being told that he is painting the kind of picture that sells well, or the author that he is writing potboilers. The literature of dignity conflicts at times with the literature of freedom. For example, quite apart from medical issues, painless childbirth is not as readily accepted as painless dentistry. The highest military rewards are given for bravery and not for intelligence. There are many other ways in which, by reducing the need for exhausting, painful, and dangerous work, a behavioral technology reduces the chance to be admired. The slide rule, the calculating machine, and the computer are the enemies of the arithmetic mind. There may be no compensating gain when dignity or worth seems lessened by a basic scientific analysis apart from technological applications. A scientific conception seems demeaning because nothing is eventually left for which autonomous man can take credit. Science naturally seeks a fuller explanation of that behavior. Its goal is the destruction of mystery. The defenders of dignity will protest, but in doing so they postpone an achievement for which in traditional terms man would receive the greatest credit and for which he would be most admired. The literature of dignity may oppose technology of behavior because it destroys chances to be admired and offers an alternative explanation of behavior for which the individual himself has previously been given credit. The literature thus stands in the way of further human achievements. Punishment. Punishment is very common in nature and we learn a great deal from it. A child runs awkwardly, falls, and is hurt. He touches a bee and is stung. He takes a bone away from a dog and is bitten. It is mainly to avoid various forms of natural punishment that people have built a more comfortable and less dangerous world. Punishment is used to induce people not to behave in given ways. Government is often defined in terms of the power to punish 
And some religions teach that sinful behavior will be followed by eternal punishment of the most horrible sort. People still control each other more often through censure or blame than commendation or praise. The military and the police remain the most powerful arms of government. Communicants are still occasionally reminded of hellfire, and teachers have abandoned the birch rod only to replace it with more subtle forms of punishment. And the curious fact is that those who defend freedom and dignity are not only not opposed to these measures, but are largely responsible for the fact that they are still with us. Reward and punishment do not differ merely in the direction of the changes they induce. A child who has been severely punished for sex play is not necessarily less inclined to continue. And a man who has been imprisoned for violent assault is not necessarily less inclined toward violence. Future occasions for sex play or for violent assault may evoke incompatible behavior through conditioning. Whether the effect is felt as shame, guilt, or a sense of sin depends upon whether the punishment is administered by parent or peer, by a government or by a church, respectively. A person may subsequently behave in order to avoid punishment. He can avoid it by not behaving in punishable ways, but there are other possibilities. Some of these are disruptive and maladaptive or neurotic. The dynamisms of Freud are ways in which repressed wishes evade the censor and find expression. There are more effective ways of avoiding punishment. A person who has been punished for drunkenness may put temptation behind him. A student may avoid situations in which he is distracted from his work. Still another strategy is to change the probability that punishable behavior will occur. A person who is frequently punished because he is quick to anger may count to ten before acting or control aggression by taking a tranquilizer. Men have even resorted to castrating themselves or following the biblical injunction to cut off the hand that offends. Punishable behavior can be minimized by creating circumstances in which it is not likely to occur. The archetypal pattern is the cloister. Another possibility is to break up the contingencies under which punished behavior is reinforced. Temper tantrums often disappear when they no longer receive attention. St. Paul recommended marriage as a means of reducing objectionable forms of sexual behavior. Measures of this sort are no doubt often inconsistent with each other and may have unforeseen consequences. It proved to be impossible to control the supply of alcohol during prohibition. Segregation of the sexes may lead to unwanted homosexuality. Excessive suppression of behavior, which would otherwise be strongly reinforced, may lead to defection from the punishing group. These problems are in essence soluble, however, and it should be possible to design a world in which behavior likely to be punished seldom or never occurs. The defenders of freedom and dignity object to solving the problem of punishment that way because such a world builds only automatic goodness. It is the environment that must get the credit. At issue is an attribute of autonomous man. Men are to behave well only because they are good. Under a perfect system, no one needs goodness. In a world in which he does not need to work hard, an individual will not learn to sustain hard work. In a world in which medical science has alleviated pain, he will not learn to take painful stimuli. He will not learn to take the punishments associated with behaving badly. Problem is to induce people not to be good, but to behave well. Goodness, like other aspects of dignity or worth, waxes as visible control wanes, and so, of course, does freedom. Hence, goodness and freedom tend to be associated. John Stuart Mill held that the only goodness worthy of the name was displayed by a person who behaved well, although it was possible for him to behave badly, and that only such a person was free. Mill was not in favor of closing houses of prostitution, they were to remain open so that people could achieve freedom and dignity through self-control. The effect may be the same. 
People may not gamble, drink, or go to prostitutes, but the fact that they cannot do so in one environment and do not do so in the other is a fact about techniques of control, not about goodness or freedom. It is sometimes said that children are not ready for the freedom of self-control until they reach the age of reason, and that meanwhile they must either be kept in a safe environment or be punished. This means simply that safe environments and punishment are the only measures available until the child has been exposed to the contingencies which give him other reasons for behaving well. The assertion that only a free man can be responsible for his conduct has two meanings. If we want to say people are responsible, we must do nothing to infringe their freedom, since if they are not free to act, they cannot be held responsible. If we want to say they are free, we must hold them responsible for their behavior by maintaining punitive contingencies. Any move toward an environment in which men are automatically good threatens responsibility. In the control of alcoholism, for example, the traditional practice is punitive. Certain medical evidence appears to be relevant. People differ in their tolerances to alcohol and their addictive dependencies. How fair is it to punish the alcoholic? Should we not rather treat the medical condition? Hence, as responsibility diminishes, punishment is relaxed. Juvenile delinquency is another example. Evidence that delinquency is commoner in certain kinds of neighborhoods and among poorer people seems relevant. A person is more likely to steal if he has little or nothing of his own, if no jobs are available, if he has not been taught to obey the law. But the real issue is the effectiveness of techniques of control. We shall not solve the problems of alcoholism and juvenile delinquency by increasing a sense of responsibility. It is the environment which is responsible for the objectionable behavior, and it is the environment which must be changed. When we make the world less punishing or teach people how to avoid natural punishments, we are not destroying responsibility. We are simply making the world safer. The concept of responsibility is particularly weak when behavior is traced to its genetic determiners. Individuals presumably differ, as species differ, in the extent to which they respond aggressively or are reinforced when they affect aggressive damage or in the extent to which they engage in sexual behavior. Are they therefore equally responsible for controlling their aggressive or sexual behavior? The issue has recently been raised by the possibility that many criminals show an anomaly in their chromosomes. The concept of responsibility offers little help. The issue is controllability. What must be changed is not the responsibility of autonomous man, but the conditions, environmental or genetic, of which a person's behavior is a function. In the old view, it was the student who failed, the child who went wrong. It is now commonly said that there are no dull students, but only poor teachers. No bad children, but only bad parents. The mistake is to put the responsibility anywhere, to suppose that somewhere a causal sequence is initiated. Those who use punishment seem always to be on the safe side. Everyone approves the suppression of wrongdoing except the wrongdoer. By opposing effective alternatives to punishment on the ground that punishment alone leaves the individual free to choose to behave well, the literatures of freedom and dignity have created a need for a kind of justification. Here is Demestre's defense of perhaps the most horrible of all punishers, the torturer and executioner. A prisoner or a murderer or a blasphemer is given over to him. He seizes him and stretches and ties him on a horizontal cross. Nothing is heard but the cry of the bones cracking under the heavy rod and the howlings of the victim. The hair stands out, and from the mouth, gaping open like a stove, come only now a few bloody words which at intervals beg for death. Now the executioner has finished. His heart beats, but it is for joy. 
He is the horror of the human association and the tie that holds it together. Without this incomprehensible agent, all order will give way to chaos and society vanish. However, our task is not to encourage moral struggle or to build or demonstrate inner virtues. It is to make life less punishing and in doing so to release for more reinforcing activities the time and energy consumed in the avoidance of punishment. Alternatives to punishment. An all-out permissiveness has been seriously advanced as an alternative to punishment. If a person behaves well, it is because he is either innately good or self-controlled. Freedom and dignity are guaranteed. Permissive practices have many advantages. They save the labor of supervision and the enforcement of sanctions. They do not expose the practitioner to the charge of restricting freedom or destroying dignity. Permissiveness is not, however, a policy. It is the abandonment of policy, and its apparent advantages are illusory. To refuse to control is to leave control not to the person himself, but to other parts of the social and non-social environments. A method is represented by Socrates' metaphor of the midwife. One person helps another give birth to behavior. Socrates demonstrated the art of midwifery in education. He pretended to show how an uneducated slave boy could be led to prove Pythagoras' theorem for doubling the square. The boy assented to the steps in the proof, and Socrates claimed that he did so without being told. As Comenius put it, the more the teacher teaches, the less the student learns. These advantages, however, are far short of the claims made. Socrates' slave boy learned nothing. There was no evidence whatever that he could have gone through the theorem by himself afterward. And it is as true of midwifery as of permissiveness that positive results must be credited to unacknowledged controls of other sorts. Guidance is not as easy as permissiveness, but it is usually easier than midwifery. One who merely guides the natural development cannot easily be accused of trying to control it. Guidance is effective, however, only to the extent that control is exerted. To arrange an opportunity is not a very positive act, but it is nevertheless a form of control if it increases the likelihood that behavior will be emitted. Those who object most violently to the manipulation of behavior nevertheless make the most vigorous efforts to manipulate minds. Evidently, freedom and dignity are threatened only when behavior is changed by physically changing the environment. There appears to be no threat when the states of mind said to be responsible for behavior are changed, presumably because autonomous man possesses miraculous powers which enabled him to yield or resist. Like permissiveness, midwifery, guidance, and building a dependence on things, changing a mind is condoned by the defenders of freedom and dignity because it is an ineffective way of changing behavior, and the changer of minds can therefore escape from the charge that he is controlling people. He is also exonerated when things go wrong. The fundamental mistake made by all those who choose weak methods of control is to assume that the balance of control is left to the individual, when in fact it is left to other conditions. The other conditions are often hard to see, but to continue to neglect them and to attribute their effects to autonomous man is to court disaster. The defenders of freedom and dignity encourage the misuse of controlling practices and block progress toward a more effective technology of behavior. Values. In what we may call the pre-scientific view, and the word is not necessarily pejorative, a person's behavior is at least to some extent his own achievement. In the scientific view, a person's behavior is determined by a genetic endowment traceable to the evolutionary history of the species and by the environmental circumstances to which as an individual he has been exposed. 
Neither view can be proved, but it is in the nature of scientific inquiry that the evidence should shift in favor of the second. Autonomous man is not easily changed, but the environment can be changed, and we are learning how to change it. Something is missing in this shift from internal to external control. For whom is a powerful technology of behavior to be used? Who is to use it? And to what end? Questions of this sort seem to point toward the future. They are said, of course, to involve value judgments. Physics may tell us how to build a nuclear bomb, but not whether it should be built. Biology may tell us how to control birth and postpone death, but not whether we ought to do so. When we say that a value judgment is a matter not of fact, but of how someone feels about a fact, we are simply distinguishing between a thing and its reinforcing effect. Things themselves are studied by physics and biology, usually without reference to their value. But the reinforcing effects of things are the province of behavioral science, which, to the extent that it is concerned with operant reinforcement, is a science of values. Things are good, positively reinforcing, or bad, negatively reinforcing, presumably because of the contingencies of survival under which the species evolved. Feelings are said to be part of the armament of autonomous man, and some further comment is in order. A person feels things within his body as he feels things on its surface. He feels a lame muscle as he feels a slap on the face. He feels depressed as he feels a cold wind. He can feel things outside his skin in an active sense. He can feel a surface by running his fingers over it to enrich the stimulation he receives from it. But even though there are ways in which he can heighten his awareness of the things inside his body, he does not actively feel them in the same way. A more important difference is in the way a person learns to feel things. If red candies have a reinforcing flavor and green candies do not, the child takes and eats red candies. A parent may teach a child to say, I am hungry not because he feels what the child is feeling, but because he sees him eating ravenously or behaving in some other way related to deprivation of or reinforcement with food. The language of emotion is not precise. We tend to describe our emotions with terms which have been learned in connection with other kinds of things. Even as a clue, the important thing is not the feeling but the thing felt. Epicurus was not quite right. Pleasure is not the ultimate good, pain the ultimate evil. What is maximized or minimized, or what is ultimately good or bad, are things, not feelings. And men work to achieve them or to avoid them, not because of the way they feel, but because they are positive or negative reinforcers. When we call something pleasing, we may be reporting a feeling. But the feeling is a byproduct of the fact that a pleasing thing is quite literally a reinforcing thing. People keep warm or safe by keeping close together. They reinforce each other sexually, and they share, borrow, or steal each other's possessions. Reinforcement by another person need not be intentional. One person learns to clap his hands to attract the attention of another, but the other does not turn in order to induce him to clap again. A mother learns to calm a disturbed child by caressing him, but the child does not become silent to induce her to caress him again. We praise and reprove people in general when their behavior is positively or negatively reinforcing to us, with no reference to the products of their behavior. But when we give a man credit for an achievement or blame him for trouble, we point to the achievement or the trouble and emphasize that they are indeed the consequences of his behavior. In working for the good of others, a person may feel love or fear, loyalty or obligation, or any other condition 
arising from the contingencies responsible for the behavior. A person does not act for the good of others because of a feeling of belongingness or refuse to act because of feelings of alienation. His behavior depends upon the control exerted by the social environment. Nothing in the behavioral processes guarantees fair treatment, since the amount of behavior generated by a reinforcer depends upon the contingencies in which it appears. In an extreme case, a person may be reinforced by others on a schedule which costs him his life. Suppose, for example, that a group is threatened by a predator, the monster of mythology. Someone possessing special strength or skill attacks and kills the monster or drives him away. The group, released from threat, reinforces the hero with approval, praise, honor, affection, celebration statues, arches of triumph, in the hand of the princess. Some of this may be unintentional, but it is nevertheless reinforcing to the hero. Some may be intentional, that is, the hero is reinforced precisely to induce him to take on other monsters. The important fact about such contingencies is that the greater the threat, the greater the esteem accorded the hero who alleviates it. The contingencies are not necessarily social. They are found in other dangerous activities, such as mountain climbing. That a behavioral process should thus go wrong and lead to death is no more a violation of the principle of natural selection than the phototropic behavior of the moth, which has survival value when it leads the moth into sunlight, but proves deadly when it leads into flame. Once we have identified the contingencies that control the behavior called good or bad and right or wrong, the distinction between facts and how people feel about facts is clear. The important thing is what they do about them, and what they do is a fact that is to be understood by examining relevant contingencies. As organized agencies induce people to behave for the good of others more effectively, they change what is felt. A person does not support his government because he is loyal, but because the government has arranged special contingencies. A person does not support a religion because he is devout. He supports it because of the contingencies arranged by the religious agency. Conflicts among feelings, as in the classical literary themes of love versus duty or patriotism versus faith, are really conflicts between contingencies of reinforcement. A common proposal is to strengthen the original controls, eliminating conflicts, using stronger reinforcers, and sharpening the contingencies. If people do not work, it is not because they are lazy or shiftless, but because they are not paid enough, or because either welfare or affluence has made economic reinforcers less effective. The good things in life have only to be made properly contingent on productive labor. If citizens are not law-abiding, it is not because they are scofflaws or criminals, but because law enforcement has grown lax. The problem can be solved by refusing to suspend or abridge sentences, by increasing the police force, or by passing stronger laws. Such proposals to strengthen old modes of control are correctly called reactionary. The strategy may be successful, but it will not correct the trouble. The process of operant conditioning presumably evolved when those organisms which were more sensitively affected by the consequences of their behavior were better able to adjust to the environment and survive. Only fairly immediate consequences could be effective. Behavior cannot really be affected by anything which follows it. A second reason has to do with the functional relation between behavior and its consequences. The contingencies of survival could not generate a process of conditioning which took into account how behavior produced its consequences. A third reason, related to the second but of a more practical nature, is that the reinforcing effect of any deferred consequence can be usurped, so to speak, 
by intervening behavior. The process of operant conditioning is committed to immediate effects, but remote consequences may be important. The gap can be bridged with a series of conditioned reinforcers. A person who has frequently escaped from rain by moving under shelter eventually avoids rain by moving before rain falls. The effective consequence is not that he does not get wet when rain eventually falls, but that a conditioned aversive stimulus is immediately reduced. Organized agencies are often justified by pointing to certain general values. The individual under a government enjoys a certain measure of order and security. An economic system justifies itself by pointing to the wealth it produces and an educational establishment to skills and knowledge. The great individualists so often cited to show the value of personal freedom have owed their successes to earlier social environments. The involuntary individualism of a Robinson Crusoe and the voluntary individualism of a Henry David Thoreau show obvious debts to society. Rousseau's great principle, that nature has made man happy and good, but that society depraves him and makes him miserable, was wrong, because his book Emile is one of the great treatises on how human behavior can be changed. Presumably, there is an optimal state of equilibrium in which everyone is maximally reinforced. But to say this is to introduce another kind of value. Why should anyone be concerned with justice or fairness, even if these can be reduced to good husbandry in the use of reinforcers? The questions with which we began obviously cannot be answered simply by pointing to what is personally good or what is good for others. Another kind of good which makes for human progress remains to be analyzed. The evolution of a culture. A child is born with a genetic endowment and he begins at once to acquire a repertoire of behavior under the contingencies of reinforcement to which he is exposed as an individual. Most of these contingencies are arranged by other people. They are in fact what is called a culture, although the term is usually defined in other ways. A person is not only exposed to the contingencies that constitute a culture, he helps to maintain them. And to the extent that the contingencies induce him to do so, the culture is self-perpetuating. A given set of values may explain why a culture functions, possibly without much change for a long time. But no culture is in permanent equilibrium. The physical environment changes. Social contingencies also change as the size of a group or its contact with other groups changes. A culture, like a species, is selected by its adaptation to an environment. To the extent that it helps its members to get what they need and avoid what is dangerous, it helps them to survive and transmit the culture. New practices correspond to genetic mutations. A new practice may weaken a culture by leading to an unnecessary consumption of resources or strengthen it by helping its members make a more effective use of resources or improve their health. We tend to associate a culture with a group of people. People are easier to see than their behavior, and behavior is easier to see than the contingencies which generate it. Since a culture tends to be identified with the people who practice it, the principle of evolution has been used to justify competition between cultures in the so-called doctrine of social Darwinism. Wars between governments, religions, economic systems, races and classes have been defended on the grounds that the survival of the fittest is a law of nature. In neither biological nor cultural evolution is competition with other forms the only important condition of selection. Both species and cultures compete first of all with the physical environment. Similarly, most of the practices which compose a culture are concerned with sustenance and safety rather than with competition with other cultures. When it has become clear that a culture may survive or perish, some of its members may begin to act to promote its survival. Why should people in the last third of the 20th century care about what the people in the last third of the 21st century will look like, how they will be governed, how and why they will work productively? Why then should a person regard the survival of his culture as a good? 
It is no help to say that a person acts because he feels concerned for the survival of his culture. Feelings about any institution depend upon the reinforcers the institution uses. And what a person feels about the survival of his culture will depend on the measures used by the culture to induce its members to work for its survival. The measures explain the support. The feelings are byproducts. Institutions may derive effective reinforcers from events which will occur only after a person's death. They mediate security, justice, order, knowledge, wealth, health, and so on, only part of which the individual will enjoy. In a five-year plan, people are induced to work hard in return for the promise of reinforcers to be received later. The Christian notion of life after death may have grown out of the social reinforcement of those who suffer for their religion while still alive. Heaven is portrayed as a collection of positive reinforcers. None of this will explain what we might call a pure concern for the survival of a culture, but we really do not need an explanation. The simple fact is that a culture which, for any reason, induces its members to work for its survival or for the survival of some of its practices is more likely to survive. The evolution of a culture raises certain questions about so-called values which have not been fully answered. Is the evolution of a culture progress? As Leslie White has put it, evolution may be defined as a temporal sequence of forms. One form grows out of another. Culture advances from one stage to another. In this process, time is as integral a factor as change of form. But change occurs not because of the passage of time, but because of what happens while time is passing. The horse's hoof did not develop because time passed, but because certain mutations were selected when they favored survival in the environment in which the horse was living. The size of a child's vocabulary or the grammatical forms he uses are not a function of developmental age, but of the verbal contingencies which have prevailed in the community to which he has been exposed. If developmental stages follow one another in a fixed order, it is because one stage builds the conditions responsible for the next. A child must walk before he can run or jump. The same issues arise in the development of a culture. A pure developmentalism, contenting itself with patterns of sequential change in structure, misses the chance to explain behavior in terms of genetic and environmental histories. A culture may develop through a sequence of stages as contingencies develop, but a different order of contingencies can be designed. We cannot change the age of the earth or of the child, but in the case of the child, we need not wait for time to pass in order to change the things that happen in time. It is a mistake to suppose that all change or development is growth. The present condition of the earth's surface is not mature or immature. The horse has not, as far as we know, reached some final and presumably optimal stage in evolutionary development. We have no reason to call any culture mature in the sense that further growth is unlikely. Maturity becomes a goal and progress becomes movement toward a goal. A goal is literally a terminus, the end of something, such as a foot race. We explain the development of a species and of the behavior of a member of the species by pointing to the selective action of contingencies of survival and contingencies of reinforcement. Both the species and the behavior of the individual develop when they are shaped and maintained by their effect on the world around them. That is the only role of the future. A remote personal good becomes effective when a person is controlled for the good of others. And the culture which induces some of its members to work for its survival brings an even more remote consequence to bear. The task of the cultural designer is to accelerate the development of practices which bring the remote consequences of behavior into play. Explicit design promotes that good by accelerating the evolutionary process. And since a science and a technology of behavior make for better design, they are important mutations in the evolution of a culture.
the design of a culture. No one knows the best way of raising children, paying workers, maintaining law and order, teaching or making people creative, but it is possible to propose better ways than we now have and to support them by predicting and eventually demonstrating more reinforcing results. A scientific analysis of human behavior is obviously relevant. It defines what is to be done and suggests ways of doing it. How badly it is needed is indicated by a recent discussion in a news weekly about what is wrong with America. The problem was described as a disturbed psychic condition of the young, a recession of the spirit, a psychic downturn, and a spiritual crisis. The passage, which is not exceptional, has two characteristic defects. The troublesome behavior is not actually described, and nothing that can be done to change it is mentioned. Consider a young man graduated from college going to work, inducted into the armed services. Most behavior acquired up to this point proves useless in his new environment. He lacks assurance, feels insecure, is insecure of himself. He is dissatisfied or discouraged. There is nothing he wants to do or enjoys. He has no feeling of craftsmanship, no sense of leading a purposeful life, no sense of accomplishment. He feels guilty or ashamed. He is disappointed in himself. To the young man, the important things are states of his body. What he tells us about his feelings may permit us to make some informed guesses about what is wrong with the contingencies. But we must go directly to the contingencies themselves if we want to be sure. And it is the contingencies which must be changed if his behavior is to be changed. Feelings and states of mind still dominate discussions of human behavior. For one thing, they have long obscured the alternatives that might replace them. It is hard to see behavior as such without reading into it many of the things it is said to express. As we come to understand the relations between behavior and the environment, we discover new ways of changing behavior. An assignment is stated as behavior to be produced or modified, and relevant contingencies are then arranged. A programmed sequence of contingencies may be needed. The technology has been most successful where behavior can be fairly easily specified and where appropriate contingencies can be constructed, for example, in child care, schools, and the management of retardates and institutionalized psychotics. The same principles are being applied, however, in the preparation of instructional materials at all educational levels in industrial management, in urban design, and in many other fields of human behavior. They all agree on the essential point. Behavior can be changed by changing the conditions of which it is a function. Such a technology can be used by villain or saint. A person may design a better way of raising children, primarily to escape from children who do not behave well, or his new method may promote the good of the children or of parents in general. If he is strongly reinforced when he sees other people enjoying themselves, for example, he will design an environment in which children are happy. We do not need to predict the future to see some of the ways in which the strength of a culture depends upon the behavior of its members. A culture that maintains civil order and defends itself against attack frees its members from certain kinds of threats and presumably provides more time and energy for other things. A culture needs various goods for its survival, and its strength must depend in part on the economic contingencies which maintain enterprising and productive labor. A culture is presumably stronger if it induces its members to maintain a safe and healthful environment, to provide medical care, and to maintain a population density appropriate to its resources and space. A culture must provide for the pursuit and achievement of happiness. A culture must be reasonably stable. Lastly, a culture will have a special measure of survival value if it encourages its members to examine its practices and to experiment with new ones. A collection of cultural designs is to be found in the utopian literature. 
Plato in the Republic chose a political solution. St. Augustine in the City of God, a religious one. Thomas More and Francis Bacon, both lawyers, turned to law and order. The Rousseauan utopists of the 18th century to a supposed natural goodness in man. The simplification of utopian writing, which is nothing more than the simplification characteristic of science, is seldom feasible in the world at large. And there are many other reasons why it is difficult to put an explicit design into effect. A large, fluid population cannot be brought under informal social or ethical control because social reinforcers like praise and blame are not exchangeable for the personal reinforcers on which they are based. It is not surprising that so far as the real world is concerned, the word utopian means unworkable. History seems to offer support. If planned economies, benevolent dictatorships, perfectionistic societies and other utopian ventures have failed, we must remember that unplanned, unindicated, and unperfected cultures have failed too. A failure is not always a mistake. The real mistake is to stop trying. Perhaps we cannot now design a successful culture as a whole, but we can design better practices in a piecemeal fashion. It is a serious problem that students no longer respond in traditional ways to educational environments. They drop out of school, possibly for long periods of time. They take only courses which they enjoy or which seem to have relevance to their problems. They destroy school property and attack teachers. But we shall not solve this problem by cultivating on the part of our public a respect for scholarship which it does not now have. We need to design contingencies under which students acquire behavior useful to them and their culture. A serious problem also arises when young people refuse to serve in the armed forces and desert or defect to other countries. But we shall not make an appreciable change by inspiring greater loyalty or patriotism. What must be changed are the contingencies which induce young people to behave in given ways toward their governments. It is a serious problem that we remain almost continuously at war with other nations, but we shall not get far by attacking the tensions which lead to war. What must be changed are the circumstances under which men and nations make war. The science of behavior is not yet ready to solve all our problems, but it is a science in progress, and its ultimate adequacy cannot now be judged. When critics assert that it cannot account for this or that aspect of human behavior, they usually imply that it will never be able to do so. The important thing is not so much to know how to solve a problem as to know how to look for a solution. The scientists who approached President Roosevelt with a proposal to build a bomb so powerful that it would end the Second World War within a few days could not say that they knew how to build it, all they could say was that they knew how to go about finding out. A proposal to design a culture with the help of a scientific analysis often leads to Cassandran prophecies of disaster. The culture will not work as planned, and unforeseen consequences may be catastrophic. History seems to be on the side of failure. Said Mr. Crutch, the threat in a design culture is that the unplanned may never erupt again but it is hard to justify the trust which is placed in accidents. It is true that accidents have been responsible for almost everything men have achieved to date, but there is no virtue in an accident as such. The unplanned also goes wrong. If a planned culture necessarily meant uniformity or regimentation, it might indeed work against further evolution. That would be bad design. But if we are looking for variety, we should not fall back upon accident. The only hope is planned diversification, in which the importance of variety is recognized. The breeding of plants and animals moves toward uniformity when uniformity is important, but it also requires planned diversity. Another kind of opposition to the new cultural design can be put this way. I wouldn't like it. To eliminate a threat, for example, is to eliminate the thrill of escape. The reinforcing value of rest, relaxation, and leisure 
is necessarily weakened as labor is made less compulsive. No convert to a religion will enjoy Cardinal Newman's release from the stress of a great anxiety. We shall have no reason to admire people who endure suffering, face danger, or struggle to be good. The art and literature of a new culture will be about other things. The problem is to design a world which will be liked not by people as they now are, but by those who would live in it. It would be liked because people have been taught to like it and for reasons which do not always bear scrutiny. A better world will be liked because it has been designed with an eye to what is or can be more reinforcing. A complete break with the past is impossible. The designer of a new culture will always be culture bound. To some extent, he will necessarily design a world he likes. Within practical limits, however, it should be possible to minimize the effect of accidental features of prevailing cultures and to turn to the sources of the things people call good. It is sometimes said that the scientific design of a culture is impossible because man will simply not accept the fact that he can be controlled. Said Dostoevsky, a man would still do something out of sheer perversity. He would create destruction and chaos. And if all this could in turn be analyzed and prevented by predicting that it would occur, then man would deliberately go mad to prove his point. There are, of course, good reasons why the control of human behavior is resisted. The commonest techniques are aversive, and some sort of counter-control is to be expected. The controlee may move out of range. The controller will work to keep him from doing so. When controllers then turn to methods which are non-aversive, but have deferred aversive consequences, additional principles emerge. The group calls it wrong to control through deception, for example, and governmental and religious sanctions follow. Who is to control? To prevent the misuse of controlling power, we must look not at the controller himself, but at the contingencies under which he engages in control. The relation between the controller and the controlled is reciprocal. Some such reciprocal control is characteristic of all science. As Francis Bacon put it, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. The scientist who designs a cyclotron is under the control of the particles he is studying. The behavior with which a parent controls his child, either aversively or through positive reinforcement, is shaped and maintained by the child's responses, shocked by the poverty of some villages. Give these people one piece of cloth and one good meal each and some oil for their heads. His friend refused. Ramakrishna was concerned not with the spiritual condition of the villagers, but with clothing, food, and protection against the sun. But his feelings were not a byproduct of effective action. He had nothing to offer but compassion. The great problem is to arrange effective counter-control and hence to bring some important consequences to bear on the behavior of the controller. The teacher is subject only to the counter-control exerted by the student. As a result, the school may become wholly autocratic or wholly anarchistic. There is a similar problem in jurisprudence when laws continue to be enforced which are no longer appropriate to the practices of the community. Self-government often seems to solve the problem by identifying the controller with the controlled. The principle of making the controller a member of the group he controls should apply to the designer of a culture. A person who designs a piece of equipment for his own use presumably takes the interests of the user into account. The intentional design of a culture, with the implication that behavior is to be controlled, is sometimes called ethically or morally wrong. The practical question is how remote consequences can be made effective. Without help, a person acquires very little moral or ethical behavior under either natural or social contingencies. The group supplies supporting contingencies when it describes its practices in codes or rules which tell the individual how to behave. There is something morally wrong about a totalitarian state, a gambling enterprise, uncontrolled piecework wages, the sale of harmful drugs or undue personal influence, not because of any absolute set of values, 
but because all these things have aversive consequences. The consequences are deferred, and a science that clarifies their relation to behavior is in the best possible position to specify a better world in an ethical or moral sense. Man has not evolved as an ethical or moral animal. He has evolved to the point at which he has constructed an ethical or moral culture. The intentional design of a culture and the control of human behavior are essential if the human species is to continue to develop. Neither biological nor cultural evolution is any guarantee that we are inevitably moving toward a better world. Extinct species and extinct cultures testified to the possibility of miscarriage. What is needed is more intentional control, not less, and this is an important engineering problem. The number of people explicitly engaged in improving the design of automobiles, for example, must greatly exceed the number of those concerned with improving life in city ghettos. It is not that the automobile is more important than a way of life, but rather that the economic contingencies which induce people to improve automobiles are very powerful. The technology of the automobile industry is also, of course, much further advanced than the technology of behavior. These facts simply underline the importance of the threat posed by the literatures of freedom and dignity. The species is prepared for short periods of leisure, but the result is very different when there is nothing to do for long periods of time. The institutionalized human being faces the problem of leisure in its worst form. It has nothing to do. Leisure is a condition for which the human species has been badly prepared, because until very recently it was enjoyed by only a few. Yet the actual effect upon human behavior may threaten the survival of a culture. The enormous potential of those who have nothing to do cannot be overlooked. They may be productive or destructive, conserving or consuming. Leisure is one of the great challenges to those who are concerned with the survival of a culture because any attempt to control what a person does when he does not need to do anything is particularly likely to be attacked as unwarranted meddling. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are basic rights, but they have only a minor bearing on the survival of a culture. The designer of a culture does not step in to disturb a natural process. He is part of a natural process. Those who have been induced by their culture to act to further its survival through design must accept the fact that they are altering the conditions under which men live and hence engaging in the control of human behavior. Good government is as much a matter of the control of human behavior as bad. Good incentive conditions as much as exploitation good teaching as much as punitive drill. A preference for methods which make control inconspicuous or allow it to be disguised has condemned those who are in a position to exert constructive counter-control to the use of weak measures. This could be a lethal cultural mutation. Our culture has the science and technology it needs to save itself. It has the wealth but if it continues to take freedom or dignity rather than its own survival as its principal value, then it is possible that some other culture will make a greater contribution to the future. What is man? As the science of behavior adopts the strategy of physics and biology, the autonomous agent is replaced by the environment, the environment in which the species evolved and in which the behavior of the individual is shaped and maintained. That a man's behavior owes something to antecedent events, and that the environment is a more promising point of attack than man himself, has long been recognized. Robert Owen first clearly grasped and taught that environment makes character, and that environment is under human control. Or as Gilbert Seldes wrote, that man is a creature of circumstance that if you change the environments of 30 little Hottentots and 30 little aristocratic English children, the aristocrats would become Hottentots and the Hottentots little conservatives. Perhaps the last stronghold of autonomous man is that complex cognitive activity called thinking. Because it is complex, 
It has yielded only slowly to explanation in terms of contingencies of reinforcement. When we say that a person discriminates between red and orange, this is the result of discrimination rather than the act. Traits of character, whether derived from contingencies of survival or contingencies of reinforcement, are also said to be stored. We say, he faced these adversities bravely, aware without thought that the bravery is a property of the man, not of the facing. A brave act is poetic shorthand for the act of a person who shows bravery by performing it. But we call a man brave because of his acts, and he behaves bravely when environmental circumstances induce him to do so. The circumstances have changed his behavior. They have not implanted a trait or virtue. Does man sin because he is sinful, or is he sinful because he sins? To say that he sins because he is sinful is to trace his behavior to a supposed inner trait. But whether or not a person engages in the kind of behavior called sinful depends upon circumstances which are not mentioned in either question. These distinctions have practical implications. A recent survey of white Americans is said to have shown that more than half blamed the inferior educational and economic status of blacks on something about Negroes themselves. The something was further identified as lack of motivation. To neglect the role of the environment in this way is to discourage any inquiry into the defective contingencies responsible for a lack of motivation. A scientific analysis of behavior dispossesses autonomous man and turns the control over to the environment. The individual may then seem particularly vulnerable. It is only autonomous man who has reached a dead end. Man himself may be controlled by his environment, but it is an environment which is almost wholly of his own making. The evolution of a culture is in fact a kind of gigantic exercise in self-control. As the individual controls himself by manipulating the world in which he lives, so the human species has constructed an environment in which its members behave in a highly effective way. Mistakes have been made, and we have no assurance that the environment man has constructed will continue to provide gains which outstrip the losses. But man as we know him, for better or for worse, is what man has made of men. When a person changes his physical or social environment intentionally, that is, in order to change human behavior, possibly including his own, he plays two roles. One as a controller, as the designer of a controlling culture, and another as the controlled, as the product of a culture. There is nothing inconsistent about this. It follows from the nature of the evolution of a culture, with or without intentional design. The human species has probably not undergone much genetic change in recorded time. Man has greatly changed himself as a person in the same period of time by changing the world in which he lives. A hundred generations will cover the development of modern religious practices and modern government and law. No more than 20 generations will account for modern industrial practices. No more than four or five for education and psychotherapy. Man has controlled his own destiny, if that expression means anything at all. The man that man has made is the product of the culture man has devised. It is always an individual who behaves, who acts upon the environment and is changed by the consequences of his action. The individual is the carrier of both his species and his culture. Yet the individual is at best a locus in which many lines of development come together in a unique set. His individuality is unquestioned. Every cell in his body is a unique genetic product, as unique as the fingerprint. And even within the most regimented culture, every personal history is unique. No intentional culture can destroy that uniqueness. It is difficult to accept change simply on intellectual grounds. The reaction of the traditionalist is usually described in terms of feelings. 
one of these to which the Freudians have appealed in explaining the resistance to psychoanalysis is wounded vanity. Ernest Jones has said, there are three heavy blows which narcissism or self-love of mankind has suffered at the hands of science. The first was cosmological and was dealt by Copernicus. The second was biological and was dealt by Darwin. The third was psychological and was dealt by Freud. Another effect is a kind of nostalgia. Old repertoires break through as similarities between present and past are seized upon and exaggerated. Old days are called the good old days when the inherent dignity of man and the importance of spiritual values were recognized. These reactions to a scientific conception of man are certainly unfortunate. Keats drank confusion to Newton for analyzing the rainbow, but the rainbow remained as beautiful as ever and became for many even more beautiful. Man has not changed because we look at him, talk about him, and analyze him scientifically. His achievements in science, government, religion, art, and literature remain as they always have been, to be admired as one admires a storm at sea, or autumn foliage, or a mountain peak. Physical and biological technologies have alleviated pestilence and famine, and many painful, dangerous, and exhausting features of daily life. And behavioral technology can begin to alleviate other kinds of ills. There are wonderful possibilities, and all the more wonderful, because traditional approaches have been so ineffective. It is hard to imagine a world in which people producing the food, shelter, and clothing they need enjoy themselves and contribute to the enjoyment of others in art, music, literature, and games consume only a reasonable part of the resources of the world and add as little as possible to its pollution, bear no more children than can be raised decently, continue to explore the world around them and discover better ways of dealing with it and come to know themselves accurately and therefore manage themselves effectively. But we have not yet seen what man can make of man.